Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Today we're going to take a few minutes and talk about the orbits of the Sun and the Moon. And to help us, we're going to have the Flat Earth's chief astronomer, Phuket. Hello, Flat Earth researchers, debaters, and debunkers. We'll often hear the argument that the heliocentric model perfectly predicts all the observations that we can make, especially when it comes to observing the Sun and the Moon. However, this is a blatantly false statement. Any model can be created from the predictive nature of sunrise and sunset or watching the moon go overhead and watching its phases throughout a month. Well, once again, we see the classic flat earth argument here. There are many models of the solar system and the earth, both flat and, and spherical. And apparently we get together and just decide upon one at random with no supporting evidence over lunch. You know, the Illuminati just makes these decisions for us and we're not to question it. Well, nothing could really be further from the truth. Models in science are developed from observation of nature. We come up with a model that explains what we observe in nature and a model that allows us to predict future events in nature. Now, a classic example is this right here. These are the solar eclipses for the next 10 years. Let's have a closer look. Now, as we can see from this webpage, we can easily predict the exact track and time of every solar eclipse for the next 10 years. We can reliably predict that on December 26th, 2019, there is going to be a solar eclipse in the vicinity of Phuket, Thailand, where Nick lives. He could easily go a little bit south and actually see this solar eclipse. And it will appear at exactly the time that it is predicted to the minute. Now it's true that orbital mechanics were worked out initially from observations based on the surface of the Earth. It's an understanding of these orbital mechanics that allow us to make these predictions for solar eclipses to the level of precision that we do. It's because we understand the movement of the Earth and the Moon in relationship to the Sun. It is the predictability of these Earth-bound observations that are then interpreted into a model. And the heliocentric model is just one of many possible models. Well, let's play devil's advocate here for a moment and give Nick the benefit of the doubt here. So let's say that the heliocentric model is one of many models. Okay, now granted, the heliocentric model allows us to predict these things to the minute, and it's very accurate. However, let's let him go ahead and propose another model, and we'll see whether or not it fits what we observe in the real world. But it, of course, is based on the assumption that the sun is at the center and the Earth is another planet orbiting the Sun. And in turn, we have the Moon orbiting the Earth. Now, of course, we know exactly where the Moon is. It is a solid object approximately 240,000 miles above the surface of the Earth. Now, how do we know this? Well, there's a number of ways that we know it. The Earth's lunar cycle, the rotation of the Moon, is approximately 27.3 days. Using Kepler's laws of planetary motion, we can use that to calculate the distance to the Moon. We can also laser range find the Moon from reflectors that were left there when we went there. So, here's a real photograph of the Earth rise over the lunar horizon. So, we're going to go ahead and let Phuket go on with his discussion. But really, these are just calculations and uh, illustrations based on earthbound observations being shown the same kind of illustrations over and over again and having it passed off as irrefutable scientific fact and that would be because it is pretty much irrefutable scientific fact the only thing that we do with our models of the solar system is refine them in very tiny ways such as the retrograde motion of mercury and that was how we came up with the theory of relativity because newtonian uh, physics got that wrong by about 45 milliseconds per century. 
but that wasn't good enough. So what we have here is a flat Earth map. And again, this isn't to say that the Earth looks like this uh, or that it has these dimensions. It is simply to illustrate that we are looking down on a stationary Earth and we have a sun and a moon uh, doing circuits above the Earth. Okay, now already we're running into serious problems here. First of all, he's got a flat Earth, which he says isn't really what it looks like. Okay, so why are you using a flat Earth then? Uh, if you can't characterize what the Earth is, why are you including it as a presupposition for your argument? Second, He's got the sun and the moon revolving over this flat earth at an undetermined distance over the equator. Okay, great. Where are your observations or your data to show that this is exactly what's happening? Uh, how fast are these objects ro rotating? What's causing them to rotate at different rates of speed? How high are they above the ground? What are they made of? Do we know anything at all about these objects? Or are you just drawing them over your illustration of a flat earth? But let's go ahead and proceed. It's not done with any huge degree of accuracy. It is simply uh, to show another way of interpreting uh, the way we see the sun and the moon behave over a period of about a month. Okay, so this ought to be pretty good. Now, mind you, the heliocentric model is based on tens of thousands of observations over hundreds of years by hundreds of different scientists. Phuket's just going to make this up off the cuff and see whether or not it explains what we see in the real world. Uh, so at the moment, what we, we have here is, is the moon up here uh, at the top, and we have the sun down here. And uh, when I start the animation, um, both the sun and the moon are going to uh, come here to this green arrow and they're going to follow these circles which loosely follow uh, the equator on the map below. Stop right here for just a second to see whether or not this matches what we see in reality. Now there are two things that I can tell you about reality and that is that no matter where you are on the earth on the same day, the phase of the moon will be the same from any location on earth. Now, the other thing is, is that if you look at the moon from the northern hemisphere, say Russia, and compare it to the moon that you see at the same time down in Australia, the image will be flipped. The moon will be upside down in one site compared to the other site. Okay, so let's have a look at this illustration. Right here is the sun, and up here is the moon. I think that we would all agree that the sunlight coming from down here straight up would cause this side of the moon facing the sun to be illuminated. So in Russia, right here, we would see a full moon. However, what would we see over here in Australia? We'd only see a half moon because the sun is down here and it's shining just on this half of the moon. This is not what we see in reality. So again, it's, it's just to, to illustrate how the moon uh, moves at a steady pace and the sun at a slightly faster pace. Now, as we have seen already, we haven't described what the moon and the sun are, where they're located or how they move. Now, we've also seen that there's a problem with the phase of the moon from different spots on the Earth on this model, okay? So now we're running into another major problem. The moon rise and the position of the moon differs from day to day by about one hour. However, if you look from new moon to new moon, it's every 27.3 days. Now, if you have two objects, the sun and the moon, going in a circle over the equator, as in this simplified model, why don't you try and figure out mathematically how you would have a one hour difference in the rise or the movement of the moon in the night sky from day to day. 
yet you have a 27.3 day difference in the phase of the moon. Where would the sun have to be and how would the sun have to move in order to make that work? And then once you figure that out, figure out whether or not that corresponds to how the sun actually moves in the daytime sky. So what I'll do is I'll just start this. And so what we had here is essentially a new moon. And we now have one day has gone by. Uh, what you can observe uh, on a daily basis is, of course, the sun going overhead. And most of the time, whether it's in the daytime or the nighttime, we will see the moon go ahead, overhead as well. You know, there's another thing that this makes me think about, too. If this is the sun and this is the moon, if the moon was at the same level or lower than the sun, wouldn't this result in an eclipse for New Zealand? If there's not an eclipse every hour of every day somewhere in the earth, by definition, the moon must be higher than the sun. Now the next question becomes is, is there any evidence to suggest that the moon is further away from the earth than the sun is? So what we have here is the moon doing a steady pace and the sun, as it's going slightly faster, getting further and further away from the moon as they both continue to do uh, regular circuits above uh, the earth on a daily basis. Uh, so at this point we would still have some kind of daytime moon but as uh, the sun uh, gets further and further away from the moon we would now have uh, the moon coming up at night and this is an observation that anyone can make anywhere on the earth you will see throughout a month that uh, the moon rises later and later each day until it is rising in the night well, this explanation may account for the fact that the moon rises about 50 minutes later each day. However, we're still running into a little bit of a problem. Let's have a look. So here's the sun. Okay, here's the moon. Most of the world would see a full moon. However, Australia would see no moon at all because it would be looking at the unlit backside of the moon. Now, what's more, what would New Zealand see? And what would India see? Now, if this is a full moon here for Asia, why can't we see the full moon in Greenland? Now, we could assume that the sun is higher than the moon. We could also assume that the sun is lower than the moon. Now, is this statement true? I think that we've already shown that if the moon was lower than the sun, there would have to, by definition, be a solar eclipse somewhere on the Earth every day. Okay, we don't see that. We don't see partial solar eclipses depending on the orientation of the sun and the moon. Now going back to our original uh, discussion on models, the problem with models is, is that they make predictions, such as this model predicts that there is no way to avoid having a solar eclipse or at least a partial solar eclipse every day if the moon is below the sun and this model is correct. Therefore, the moon must be higher than the sun in order for this model to be correct. You see, what you do is you come up with a model and try and make a prediction with it, and then compare that prediction to what you see in the real world. So, for example, in the heliocentric model, which is our current understanding, we can very accurately predict when a solar eclipse will occur, such as that one coming to Southeast Asia on the 26th of December it will arrive within a minute of what we predict, okay? That's very strong evidence that our model is correct. Can this model predict a solar eclipse to the minute in 90 days? I'll let you decide that. And the, the animation will stop in a minute, but that's all this is meant to do, is to show that we have the moon doing a very predictable, steady pace, and we also have the sun doing uh, the same thing, but uh, it's going at its own pace. You know, I think I've humored Phuket enough uh, with his silly little flat earth model here. I don't think I need to do it any further. 
So we've got a couple of problems that we've identified already. First of all, there's going to be different phases of the moon in different parts of the world. Second, the moon has to be further away from the earth than the sun is. Okay, no evidence for either of these. Third, and that's this illustration right here I just want to call your attention to. Now, according to Paquette's model, the only time that we can have a new moon, which is a non-visible moon on Earth, is when the moon and the sun are right next to each other, basically overlapping, and the sun is blocking the moon from our view. However, we see new moons at night when the moon is supposedly on the other side of the Earth. That just doesn't work. Well, I think I've given Phuket enough of my time and your time as well. So this idea that the sun and the moon are local and revolve around the equator or somewhere thereabouts is about as absurd as the idea that the Earth is flat. We've already demonstrated that it doesn't fit reality. It doesn't fit the observations of the moon phases. It doesn't fit um, how new moons occur. It doesn't fit how solar and lunar eclipses occur. Now, you start adding things like the transit of Venus and Mercury to that, and, you know, it just, it falls apart. Now, this is why you can't just make up a theory or a model to fit your fantasy. You have to actually make your model based on reality and observations of reality, and the model tries to explain what you see to the point that you can use that model to predict things that occur in the future, much as we predict solar and lunar eclipses years in advance. So, until the flat Earth starts thinking like science, they will never be science. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and sign out. This is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for stopping by to have a look at my video and my channel. If you get a second, go down and hit that little like and subscribe down there. I'd love to have you on Team Bob. You can also check out my Patreon if you want to support the channel. We'll have several more videos this week. I'm getting back into the swing of things, and thanks for your patience while I took a little break. Take care.